You know, that's a fascinating question because the Muslims themselves that I have talked to have made an interesting comment. They say that there's a very thin line between the so-called moderate and the extremist. Uh, we use those terms, but isn't it interesting when the so-called extremists do what they actually do, the moderates are the last ones to really stand up and condemn it. It's almost like the extremist is used as a front for what greater numbers of people want to accomplish. And so you twist words, play with words, create caricatures, and then when it is a terrible act, the extremist gets blamed. But when it is an act that is acceptable by and large, then the whole uh, mass of people will claim credit for it. Uh, when you use a setting that has no name for a country, and when you use the term extremist to accomplish your goal, all you're really doing is providing a, a shadow for yourself or a wall for yourself to protect you. But what is actually happening is what you want happened as well. Well, when I think of fast forward jihad, I see it as something was an idea that was gaining momentum. Uh, they needed to test the waters. They needed to see how initial smaller efforts would look uh, to the world at large. And then when multiplied into greater numbers, it is a gradual building of acceptability of something that is so criminal. And I think that's exactly what has happened over the last 20 years. The human mind is an amazing thing. Uh, you know, Adolf Eichmann made the comment, he said, one death is a tragedy, a million is a statistic. And so the fast forward idea capitalized on that. You take one or two tragedies, build it upon greater tragedies till the larger numbers just become statistics. And people behind such criminal acts are brilliant people. They know exactly what they're doing. They know how they're doing it. They know what the end game is in mind. And I believe if we look back upon the last 30 years, we'll see how it was conceived, implemented, and fulfilled. And now we are seeing it in great numbers, and it has just become statistics. The follower of Jesus Christ has been persecuted right from the beginning. In fact, the very name Christian was used in a derogatory sense. It was used as a sarcastic sense for some kind of marginalized group of people. The persecution of even the Old Testament heroes uh, is given to us in the book of Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, taking all the way from Abel through to Abraham and then Jacob and Joseph and uh, um, Moses and so on, how they were all uh, persecuted for their faith because they were looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. And actually, when I think of Bishop Hike, my response is, had the book of Hebrews been written in our time, he would have been mentioned in there because he had a hope that was not ashamed and he was certain of that which was not evidently seen at that time. And so when the book of Hebrews gives us the list of heroes in chapter 11, and then begins in chapter 12 by saying, seeing we are surrounded by such a great cloud of examples and heroes, let us also run the race looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Jesus was more than persecuted. Jesus was ultimately killed and in the plan of God became that substitutionary sacrifice. But that does not take away from the fact that martyrdom was an aspect of it as well. It's a marvelous idea that has not really been embodied in its history or in its precepts. When you hear words like there are two houses, the house of Islam and the house of war, those are violent terms. When you hear words like perish the Jews and the Christians, there shall be no two faiths in Arabia. Those are violent words. And then when it gives you just enough of a comfort margin that tells you that you are to kill those who stand in the way and oppose unless they repent, uh, and certain conditions are given which can be manipulated for so-called uh, use of peaceful language, it's history has been a history of the sword. Its propagation has been the propagation by the sword. Take an example. 
when, for example, the Quran is quoted that there is no compulsion in belief, it ought to be understood in a very real way then. Is a person in Iran free to disbelieve? Is a person in Malaysia free to disbelieve? Is a person in Indonesia free to disbelieve? If you're not free to disbelieve in a certain faith, then there is compulsion in that faith. Uh, I talked to a professor from the University of Bethlehem, who is the head of the Islamic studies there. I said, what would you do if your daughter wanted to follow some other faith other than the one you are asking her to follow? He just looked at me point blank and in an emotionless expression, he said, I'd kill her. Is that a religion of peace? Is that a good representative of Islam or a bad one? If the moderate really wants to be seen as a moderate, he or she should speak up. When, for example, Mr. Khomeini called for the death of Salman Rushdie, was that a good Muslim speaking or a bad Muslim speaking? We need to understand these terms. Was he speaking uh, uh, on behalf of the Quran or something contrary to the Quran? Why do we not hear the masses telling us what is true out here? To me, the desire to kill and violent and obliterate is not a sign of strength, it's a sign of weakness. To me, it is not then religion, it is using religion to propagate ideology and political theory. From my point of view, it's history, it's language, it's example, and it's silences actually tell us there's more violence and war than so-called peace, which sounds very nice to say so, but is not sustained either in its history or in its teaching. The answer to that is absolutely yes, they should continue. But I think wisdom ought always to dictate the how, the when, and the where. I don't think one should cavalierly uh, do these things. One should be wise within the system in which limited possibilities are there, someday the gospel will triumph. I have absolutely no doubt because truth will triumph in the end and truth is the most powerful weapon. And Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I shall draw all people unto me. I believe that's what will happen. But you know, in the Old Testament, there's a fascinating story of Naaman who came from Syria and was healed by Elisha. And before he left, he said to Elisha, what shall I do when my master, the general, to the king, takes me into the temple at the temple of Ramon and he leans on me so I too am forced to bow down at the same time. Elisha gave him a very fascinating answer. He said, go and God will be with you. He didn't come right out and say, yeah, go and say, no, I'm not going to do this or clench your fist or whatever. He said, go and God will be with you. I think God's voice will lead individuals in their witnesses. So we shall be wise till the day comes where we can be public and we can be open. Wisdom is what is called for here. And in the ones and the twos and the threes, the triumph will come in the end. I think Bishop Hike was a great man and a great Christian. Uh, I wept. When I got the word, I was sitting right at my desk when I got the word. And I said, what a marvelous example of a man who used his voice and who used his influence and who used his reach for the sake of a fellow believer. And there he was speaking for Mahdi Dibaj to make sure that he would get that which was fair and proper and not that which was manipulated. But Bishop Hike's life shows the contrast between authenticity and duplicity. Those who killed him were duplicitous people. They hid behind false words and false ideas and false systems. We know who did it, but they hid behind the smoke and the mist of uh, other uh, names and categories. Bishop Hike was who he was transparently. He was public in what he claimed. He was authentic in how he did it. He was a martyr in his heart and unafraid to pay the price. To answer your question, I wept when I heard it, but rejoiced that there were people like him who were courageous right to the last moment. And that's what true martyrdom is. He did not use violence. He did not spread violence. 
he was against violence and was protecting the innocent. That's how he was willing to die. That's what martyrdom is. Martyrdom is not violent in its means. It is peaceful and authentic in its method. It is hard to live in the comfort zone in which I live and actually give a message to those who live daily with such dangers. They should be giving messages to us. So all I want to say to them is thank you for who you are. Thank you for how you do it. Thank you for your willingness to pay the price. I have no message other than to say to them, we as fellow believers and fellow pilgrims are grateful for their example and their sacrifice is not in vain. The Bible says no persecution or trial for the moment is joyous. Rather, it is grievous, but afterwards when it is finished will accomplish the peaceable fruit of righteousness. So to them I say, you have more to teach us than we have to teach you. But as those who are far away, we are grateful for your example and stand with you in prayer and love and gratitude. I travel, my life is threatened. Sometimes I get phone calls, sometimes I get this kind of a message, that kind of a message. All I know is that Jesus told us that the last chapter that is written is triumphant for the message of the gospel. And those of us who have to pay with our lives do not do so in vain. We do so for the cause of that which is true and that which is right. And the cowards who try to exterminate it will one day have to stand before God and find out they were wrong and that the love of Christ will win out in the end. You know, I stand before many hostile audiences. I've covered about 60 countries, thousands of cities, and hundreds of university campuses. There are several kinds of people in front of you whenever you speak, whenever you present the truth. There's the openly hostile, the clenched fist, supposedly strong but inwardly a coward who has no real belief that God can solve these things, so he or she takes it upon himself or herself by violent means to do it. Then there are the open questioners who supposedly are intellectuals who will sort of come at you and come against you. But then there's the quiet person sitting and listening to the answers who is actually hoping that you are right and the clenched fist approach is wrong. And to the masses who listen quietly and do not openly challenge, this will be a powerful medium. They are the ones who are really looking for the truth. The hostile ones are so prejudiced, they are really not looking for the truth, they are just looking to distort the truth. To give truth to him who loves it not is to only give him or her more multiplied reasons for misinterpretation. Those who don't love the truth, when you answer them, you're only giving them more fodder for them to misinterpret. But there are many who do love the truth, who silently listen. A film like this will be winning them to the right way and consolidating them on how to walk in the right way. And who knows, maybe the clenched fist ones will listen too. And there the miracle of God will transform a heart. The Apostle Paul told us, that he became all things to all people, so that he by my all means might reach some. This film is one of those means. We're living in times of great tension, great unease. Sometimes the person who is shouting and screaming with a clenched fist has a legitimate reason in the heart because sometimes decisions have been made and politics has gotten into it, that creates the wrong impression. But we have to always remember that our means must be in keeping with our message. If we use ignoble means to propagate a noble message, we are defeating the message. We have to have a method that is in keeping with the message. The message of Christ was a noble message. It was a message of love a message of grace, a message of forgiveness, a message of hope, a message of endurance, a message of loving your fellow human being uh, as yourself. And so our method has to be in keeping with that. Those who supposedly are propagating a noble message by ignoble means, and you see it all around, are really telling you their message is not noble either. So we can see it for what it is. 
as tough as the times are, it is also a time where good questions are being raised and the Christian needs to be prepared. The Apostle Peter says to us to always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that is within us, but to do that with gentleness and respect. You respect the questioner. Behind every question is a questioner. You must understand the questioner and respect the questioner if the answer is going to be in keeping with the message. So my challenge to the Christian, wherever you are, wherever you may be, keep the method in keeping with the message. Those whose method is violent and ignoble are really revealing what their message is all about too. And the contrast will stand out in the day when God shines his light upon truth and against falsehood. So we know that the truth is the most powerful weapon in the world and in the end will show the error for what it is.